When someone desires to be baptized, would you think there'll be anything that should hinder them? If someone were to come forward and say, I want to be baptized, and I said, well, there's some things hindering you from doing so, you probably say, well, why are you doing that? But we read in Acts the 8th chapter where a man of Ethiopia, who was a man of great authority as he looked over and had control over the queen of Ethiopia's treasury, well, had been traveling to Jerusalem. And an angel appears on the scene, but the angel does not appear to this Ethiopian worshiper in Jerusalem. He appears to Philip, the evangelist. I want you to go down south, and I want you really to intercept a man that is going to be coming that way in Gaza, which is desert. And Philip did that. So this man is already as making his trip back home. The timing had been such that they would meet. An angel does not appear to the person that needs to be taught what to do to be saved. It's the preacher, and the Holy Spirit doesn't even speak to him. He speaks to the preacher. Let's go get in that chariot. So we find the events unfolding where... Something had happened that this man knew about baptism. And he makes the statement and he asks the question, which I think is a good one to cause us to think this morning. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37. What was the inspired preacher's response? We'll see that. But that's indeed a question. That there, there could be something that I need to either know or do before baptism. That would be the thing of hindering me to be baptized. And I think there are, be, there are people that come across that. What does hinder me to be baptized? Because there's something there. And I need to know what it is because on the other side of this thing is water. There is water where camels are. There's water where deserts are. And in our particular case, we find that's exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch said. Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So we're going to see how Philip responds to that. But one of the things he says to him, If thou believest, thou mayest. So what stood between the eunuch and water for baptism was something that needed to be accomplished first. If thou believest, thou mayest. So this morning I want, I'd like to investigate with you what's involved in that belief. What am I to believe? Is there anything specific I need to believe? So I can be baptized. And we're going to put those things together and to see also where men come in and say, you know, there's something else you're going to have to do. We want to talk about that too, and the lesson will be yours. But in this idea of believing, what do we believe? First of all, we need to believe the gospel message. It is essential. You don't just start believing anything you want to or having some kind of an experience, but you believe the gospel message. Remember in our example that Joel read, this passage, beginning from Isaiah 53, in verse 7, we'll find that he was reading that passage as he's speaking about himself or some other person, some other man, and beginning from this passage, he preached Jesus to him. Jesus is the central figure of the gospel message. And what we see here in Isaiah 53 that's applied to Jesus, and if you have your Bibles open to the Old Testament, go there with me. Because I'm, I'm talking about verses 6 through 8 to lay down, I think, a context that might help us in understanding Acts 8. 
but he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He didn't have a Bible like we have, all the verses and so forth. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he got to the place in the scroll that we pick up in our Bibles, Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed. And when he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Don't you remember that in Acts 8? He didn't open his mouth at all. He's like a lamb. He said nothing as he goes to the slaughter. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who among them considered that he was cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Now you go back to with me in Acts the 8th chapter. And he says, in his humiliation, verse 33, was taken away. His generation, who shall declare? Declare what? For his life is taken from the earth. What does that mean? I think the text would help us understand. They couldn't declare, why was he taken away? They did not know that he died. He was taken away from my transgressions. To which the stroke, death, was due. Now there is the central part. I mean he died for me? He, sh he shed his blood for me? That's exactly what we're talking about. Jesus died. We deserve the penalty of our sin, death. He took that penalty upon us. He didn't take sin upon himself. I think we transported all our sins to him. He took the penalty of our sins and he died. And this was part of that gospel message. So when Jesus tells his apostles to go out and preach the gospel, in Matthew's account, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, what were they to be involved in preaching? Mark 16, 15, 16, you go preach the gospel. Whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Believeth what? The gospel. That message of Jesus dying for our sins. And this is the point that we're making here. In Romans the 10th chapter, if we're going to believe the gospel message, or we're going to have this faith that allows us to be baptized, we're going to have to understand Jesus and to believe certain things about, about him. In Romans the 10th chapter, in verses 11 through 16, it's going to have to come through the preaching of the gospel. Beginning with verse 11, for the scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. Either the Ethiopian was a Jew or he could have been a proselyte, a Gentile. Traveling a thousand miles, Jerusalem and back to Ethiopia. Probably traveling a chariot four to five miles an hour, 250 hours of traveling at least because he wanted to worship the one true God. And here he was reading about Jesus now, Jew or Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all, is rich unto all that call upon him. But who shall call upon the name of the, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him who they have not, not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? Well, I can have an experience. I don't have to know about Jesus. I just have experience before God and God saved me. That's not how it works. That's not how it works as we see people being saved, being baptized. They needed to believe in him, Jesus, the central character of the gospel. And how can they do they have that have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? That's the beautiful message that makes the feet who's traveling to preach beautiful. It's the message he's bringing. Well, there's going to be people that not listen, who won't hear. Verse 18, but verse 17, but so belief cometh of hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. In Acts the 16 chapter, we find an example of this necessity of hearing the message. The Philippian jailer, afraid that he lost his prisoners, was ready to do himself in, kill himself. And Paul is standing there, no doubt, in that, still in the, that area of the cell and said, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And he said, what shall I do to be saved? 
And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Now, I want to just stop there. What? He had an experience. He had an experience that said, God must be telling me something. I am a believer because the earth shook, prison doors open, prisoners who would normally leave is not. This must be the Lord. I believe. But that's not how it works. You're going to have to hear the word of the Lord to know it's not just believing in God. It's believing in his son who died. I don't know why he was taken away. As if he's taken away because he took the penalty of our sins. You need to know that. And so when, the, when Philip preaches Jesus to him, that's why he needs to know in order to get to the point of being baptized. And that's exactly what we see the process taking place. Now, we also have to have faith in his blood. Turn with me to Romans, the third chapter, verses 25 and 26, where Apostle Paul is speaking about this theme of justification. And it's not by the law of Moses. It's not that we did all these works according to law, and therefore we are going to be saved out of debt instead of grace, as you'll get into the fourth chapter. That's the big context. But it is, it is faith in his blood that's specific in what is specified. For it says in verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he says in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in the person, Christ Jesus whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Here's God's wrath, and how, I'm going, how is God going to appease his wrath on my sin? Faith in Christ's blood. He died for my transgressions and your transgressions. So it's faith in his blood to show his righteousness because the passing over the sins done aforetime. God, how come... You can justify, I overlook these sins because I know my son's going to die on the cross. I can be forbearing until that event and then realize that all sins were going to be set forth and taken care of by the blood of Christ when he, when he died on the cross. So he could be just with sin and a justifier of him that hath faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus in what way? His blood. He shed his blood for me to live and for you to live. So I have to have faith in his blood. Through the message of the gospel, I do that. But there's other parts of that gospel too. And then we see this set forth in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. That wonder if you don't know about Jesus' resurrection. Wonder if you do and Jesus was never raised. How does Paul look at that? Well, that's no big deal. We, he, he died for my sins. That's all I care about. No, it's not, that's not God's plan. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, neither hath Christ been raised. Now listen to this. If Christ hath not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Where did you get faith? My preaching. You told me why the transgression was due me and who took it on him. You told me that. His blood. I have faith in his blood, as Hebrews 9, 22 and 26. Without the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Verse 26, that's what Jesus did, the shedding of his blood. Got that, he died. His blood is where I can be cleansed from my sins, not apart from his resurrection from the dead. Because if he's not raised, your preaching is, my preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Does that not tell us that it's the death and the resurrection of Christ. Those are the specifics in the gospel message that was for my behalf so I could be free from my sin and have the hope of heaven. Aren't those both necessary? John 80 verse 24 tells us that except you believe that I am, meaning deity, you'll die in your sins. Believe his death Believe his resurrection. I mean, I gotta believe he's deity. You'll die in your sins if you don't. Except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. You're gonna die in your sins 
if you don't believe that fact about Jesus. Well, how was that confirmed? In Romans, the first chapter in verse 4, we see that it was confirmed in a miraculous way. Because verse 4 of Romans 1 says, Who was declared to be the Son of God, there's his deity, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus was raised. I preach that to you because it is essential. It confirms that he's deity. It also is substantiated a needed part of the, of, the, of the plan of salvation, of knowing his deity, believing in that, and believing he was raised from the dead, and that his blood was shed. He gave his life so we could be, have our sins forgiven, so there could be appeasement, the propitiation of God's judicial wrath. I mean, that's the central part of the gospel message. Except you, if you believe us, thou mayest, believe what? The gospel message, did he not preach Jesus? In doing that, he dealt with his sacrifice for our sins, for whom the transgression, the, and the blow of that transgression was due to us. He took it on himself. He was raised from the dead. And that's what we see taking place in the preaching of Jesus. But he says something else on this occasion. I may believe in my heart all these facts so I can be baptized. But I must confess them as well. And we see that taking place in this example of conversion that God has brought forth in his word for us to examine and to believe and to obey ourselves. So when he was told, if thou believest, thou mayest, we pick up, as was read in your hearing, if thou believest, thou mayest, and he answered. Here's the response. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Must one do that before they're baptized? Yes. That's part of completing this part, do you believe? Now be willing to confess that. Speak with God about his son, about why he died, about the fact of his deity. It was confirmed by his resurrection. Those things I must trust in God. That's true. I believe that. So I'm coming to be baptized and I'm going to confess. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Is that necessary? Turn with me to Romans, the 10th chapter. In this great book of grace, the free gift of salvation, not by works of law, in that whole context of being justified by faith, we see how faith works and, it's this, and how it works is necessary. Listen to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if thou wilt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, he's the Son of God, and shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. Oh, I got, I'm glad he, preacher included that resurrection, not just his death. I got that. Thou shalt be saved. He explains. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Believe what? Death includes his resurrection. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You mean salvation is here, and what leads to salvation is me confessing with my mouth that Jesus is Lord? That's what the passage tells us. And if there were a barrier between baptism and the person, what hindereth me to be baptized? It would be belief and the confession of that belief with our mouth. Why did God do that? He didn't tell us. But when you speak and say what's in your heart, there is a commitment to that. And God adds us to his spiritual temple, his church, one stone at a time. 
and the foundation upon which it's laid is upon Jesus Christ and our willingness to confess who he is in our life. And as we're baptized in Christ, he puts us that, that kind of stone one upon another because we, it's very personal. We did not back off. We did not hesitate. We did not keep back the fact, I believe that he is the son of God. Confession here is not confessing your sins. It's confessing who Jesus is. That is a hindrance to being baptized into him if you don't do that. But it's based upon believing, not by experience, but believing by understanding, having that knowledge. And this is what the preacher added to the knowledge when he preached Jesus. He's adding to the knowledge, if thou believest, thou mayest. And he made that good confession. It's not in scripture we can put that, but what happens if I don't repent? Because in Acts the second chapter in verse 38, when people were convicted of their sins, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The inspired apostle Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He didn't say just be baptized. He said, repent. What does it mean? What does it mean? Let's start with the attitude that leads to repentance. What should be in our hearts? 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and verse 10. Paul speaks about this, and he contrasts it with a worldly sorrow. And see if we can make sense of this. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow is not repentance. Repentance is not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to the repentance that God wants us to have. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. He says, it's a repentance which bringeth no regret. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What could be that sorrow? I got caught in doing something that's embarrassing. The fact I got caught is what I'm sorry about. Not the fact that I did something. That person will probably do it again in a pinch or with, when things are difficult for them. But godly sorrow says, God, here I am, your creation, and my sins, I have fallen short of your glory. And God, I am sorrowful toward you. I have come short of the glory that you ought to have in my life. I haven't lived, I've lived a sinful life. And because of that sorrow, I'm now going to change my mind, which will lead to a change of conduct. That's where we get into repentance. It's a change of mind that produces the change of conduct according to that change of mind towards sin. For example, when John, he preached the baptism of repentance. People came to his baptism as he was preparing the way for our Lord. He came and he preached a baptism of repentance, but this is what he said in verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruit worthy of repentance. Change of life. That fits with the change of mind. These people said, we're Abraham's children. We just continue doing what we want to do. But we're coming repenting. Now you need to change your mind about things because I can, I'm stoned, God can make his own children. He doesn't need you. But you need him. Bring forth fruit. Fruit what? Of that seed that it starts with godly sorrow towards sin. I don't want to live that way any longer. And therefore I change my conduct. Peter, in Acts the third chapter in verse 19. We find that he's preaching to the people. And he says, repent ye therefore and turn again. Repentance is not turning again. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to turning again. Turning again to what? We'll see it in a few minutes. 
But he says, turn again that your sins may be blotted out. That's kind of fit with baptism for the remission of sins. Repentance is necessary so that your sins may be blotted out. There come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. That now I'm one with the Lord again. I've fallen short of his glory. The guilt of sin is upon me. His wrath is there. But I believe in Christ who appeases his wrath. Faith in his blood. Believe in his resurrection. Believe in who he is. And I'm willing to confess who he is. And I, out of godly sorrow, are changing my mind about sin, and I'm going to turn to something. What is that turning? In Acts, the 26th chapter, in verse 20, we read, But he declared both to Damascus. This is Paul before King Agrippa, talking about why he's preaching the gospel, and why he's standing before him. But he was to send, God sent him to, and declared both to them of Damascus first, that's where he was, and at Jerusalem, they spread it out, and throughout the country of Judea, they spread it out, it's not to Jews only, but also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. They need to repent and turn again. Turn again, what? Turn to God. You've been uh, separated from him. You've been going the opposite way from him. You've been doing what you want to do. You're falling short of his glory. And now godly sorrow has said, I'm going to change my mind. And it's going to change my life. And I'm ready to turn to God. Doing works worthy of repentance. It fits with the change of mind towards sin. It's not, said, as Paul will argue in Romans 6, that some might think, here's God's grace, and it is enough to cover all of our sins. And you sin some more, you got more grace. You never can, can over, overcome God's grace. So he says, as some are saying, let us continue to sin, that grace may abound. Because grace is all going to be covered. He said, God forbid. We died to sin. Where? In our baptism. Romans 6. When they came to the waters of baptism, this mindset is already there. I turned my mind, I changed my mind about sin. I'm not going to live like that any longer. And I'm going to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. I'm now turning to you, God. And going to serve you and glorify you in my life. And my works will show that it's befitting of this change of mind. That's what we see about repentance. When a person has come to that point, I know of nothing that hinders them to be baptized in the New Testament. Now, I might add some things because of the times we live. Baptism places us into the church. Paul says we're baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12th chapter. And if people are turning from sin, the people in New Testament days, they didn't have denominations to choose from. They did not have different groups all claiming to be of Jesus. Preaching grace. Preaching salvation in Jesus. They didn't have all these different groups to choose from. And yet we realize that God is baptized. We're baptized. He adds us to his church. I think in our day and time, we might need to know that. What are you going to be baptized into? Back then, it was just the body of Christ. That's all you had. You didn't have denominations. Am I being a Pharisee? Am I being a legalist to what we see in the New Testament to bring that into our discussion? I've seen firsthand, and David has been with me before, where we had people saying, we have all these baptisms in South Houston. We need some people to go in and teach them. David went with me one day, and we went to see them. And the two I met 
Day was with me on one was a Catholic. He had not heard why he needed to change from Catholicism. But our brethren had taught him Jesus' death, his resurrection, repentance from what? You know, from sin. And there's, they're going to save that for later. I understand that mindset. Here we go. You know, what do they need to know before they're baptized? I understand that. But they had no clue about the one church. They had no reason to ever think that I might need to change from Pope to realize, call no man your father. Might not even know I need to do that because that was kept from them. That's what we were now told to do. And when we did, the cases I went, they remained Catholic and they remained a Methodist. And the Methodist I brought to church here, she came one time with me. And she had enough. I think in our day and time, if you're going to turn to God and realize there's only one body, one church, you need to prepare them. They may not be there yet. They need to prepare. No, if that's the way the truth is, I am going to turn from that. Because I realize what you're saying, that's true, that's sinful. Then that would be another situation where at least they have been warned about that. So that would be something added to what we see in the New Testament that I think is essential. When the apostles went about preaching the kingdom, that's the rule of God and he's head of the church. And I think that understanding of the church must be there. But with that said, are you to remember all the specific sins you have ever done to repent of so you can be baptized? He said, repent. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And it's my sins that Jesus died for. Let me enumerate my sins. And you, do you have to have a record of that? Some are teaching that. And they will not baptize you. <coughs> until you repent of every specific sin you've ever committed. I guess I'm going to go talk to my mother. Because she's probably got a few I hadn't remembered. And then I, do I trust her memory? I mean, is that what we see? No, I see the repenting of their sins. And what we see in Acts 2.41, apparently they did it. They did exactly how God would have them because they were told to repent. And those that received the word were baptized. You're not baptized until you repent. Does that mean they had to stand there and recall in their mind all the sins I've ever done so I can be baptized? This very hour, there are people I know of are being hindered to be baptized. Until they do that. Recount every sin. Can you not realize and say, I'm a sinner. I've done all sorts of sins. And I'm repenting of every one of them that I know. Because I have godly sorrow. I'm going to turn from them. And if you want to bring up something that I've done down the road that I'm not doing right yet, I'm going to repent of that too. I confess that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm turning to God and His Son for salvation. And I'm going to live and bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. I just can't remember all of them right now. And there was no confessing of our sins before baptism. We're confessing who Jesus is. I think that's added by man. Ladies and gentlemen, there are discipling groups around and they're meeting at different places and they're going to take control because they're going to make disciples of you and here's some of the things that they're doing the second thing you're going to have to quit your sinful habits right now you own drugs you quit it today we'll baptize you tomorrow we're talking about habitual things. 
And my question is, when people say that, I'm going to have to quit, and a lot of times it's drugs or it might be smoking, which is dealing with addiction. There are addictive personalities. You ever seen people go through a pack of gum in one day? They're probably addictive personalities. But there's drugs and nicotine is indeed that, heroin, all those things. And a person you're working with wants to be, what hinders me to be baptized? I need to repent of my sins. wonder if he's realized, hey, I realize what you're saying. I realize over in 1 Corinthians 6 that I'm going to flee fornication because my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to use my body and control of that in that same chapter. I will not be under the power of anything. Skittles included. I don't let anything overcome me. I'm going to be glorifying God in my body. That means Skittles are sinful. Just an illustration. But when something has control over you, I may need to work on that. But my question is, how long is the probation period before I can get baptized? If I've got to quit something that is an habitual sin, what if I realize I know that? Can a person say, I am repenting, changing my mind about this. I'm now going to turn to God and I'm going to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. But I'm going to fail sometime. Will I not till I conquer this? Oh no, you don't fail. You, before I baptize you, you're going to quit it. I ask you, how long is the probation period? Give me the scripture. I don't see that. But I can see a person said, I realize that's sinful. And I'm going to turn to God. And God help me as I strive to overcome my habit. Could you baptize that person? I believe you do that this morning. Without reciting all of your sins you've ever done. But you realize I've fallen short of his glory in my life. I want to turn my life. And you'll continue to learn and grow and change. But all of that change will be according to the fruits of repentance. When you made your mind up, I'm dying to myself. Out of godly sorrow, I'm going to live unto God. And I'm coming to be baptized to have that old man put to death. With repentance and the forgiveness of my sins, I'm going to be raised to walk as a new creature. And God's going to add me to his church based upon my confession and my repentance and my baptism into Christ. I say there are three things this morning that may be hindering you scripturally from being baptized. And that's believing the gospel message. Let's say you believe that message. You believe Jesus is the Son of God. You believe he died for your sins and you deserve to die and he died in your place. And you realize I have the guilt of sin upon me and God is going to be just with sin. He'll punish it in the last day. But the only way I can have the forgiveness is by His grace through Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to confess that with my mouth. And let me just say this. That day, I don't know who all was there. When Philip and the unit got together. Maybe there's some other people driving the horses and chariots. Probably not a big crowd. But we don't have to wait to assembly for you to be baptized. We're offering one this morning. We we'll don't wait till everybody gets here for you to be baptized. It's just the preacher, this man, they both went down the water. And where in the world did they get to that point? Where in the world had they gotten there? He first preached Jesus to him, and the next thing he says, here's water, what to hinder me to be baptized. And it's not the preacher saying that. It's the one who's being taught. Where did that person know about baptism? You preach Jesus. It necessitates preaching baptism. <clears throat> Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now you know why. Because what God does when we're baptized, we're baptized into Jesus' death, where his blood was offered to 
cleanse us from our sins. And because of our faith in his resurrection, which confirms he's the son of God, which you believe, you're raised to walk in the newness of life. So if thou believest, thou mayest. And he did that. And we see in Acts 2.38, people were to repent in order to be in order to be baptized. And we see them in Acts 16.33, where that jailer, what did he do? He washed away the stripes. Oh, you didn't cleanse them and take them off the back, but you washed them, you cleansed them. What was that a sign of? Repentance of the wrong that had been done to Paul? And maybe he was involved in doing it or encouraging it. Acts 2, you put to death the Son of God. We're repenting of that sin. Well, there may be specific sins in mind. But I don't see anywhere where they recorded all their shortcomings. Where if they have addictive habits and they realize that's not the life of a Christian, I'm turning from them. Please help me as I try to overcome it. I said, no, you're going to have to quit it before we baptize you. I don't read that. But confessing, because we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth and repenting of our sins. Those are the only things keeping you from being baptized. It's the knowledge of the gospel. It's the response, confessing and repent of your sins. And we can baptize you into Christ. And we hope that you'll do that in this assembly. You'll be among people that are Christians. We've all done that. And we will rejoice with you as you become a child of God. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, respond in the way we see in the New Testament and be saved today as we stand and as we sing.